Hello, KCIW listeners, and welcome to Curry Cafe, where we put together a panel of volunteers and guests who discuss various topics from whimsical and fun to more serious subjects. Well, hello, and once again, welcome to another edition of the Curry Cafe. My name is Ray Gary, and I'm more or less going to be hosting the show today. And it's, as Rick just said, we have whimsical and serious subjects, and I think it's going to be kind of a serious one today. We have two very honored guests who will introduce themselves in just a minute. And I will start off the program after they introduce themselves with my segment called Lie of the Week. So why don't we start? you and we'll go around and introduce yourself who you are what you do and why you think you should be here (laughs) hi rick i'm father bernie thank you for having me well rick is the host but you're ray and (laughs) thank you for having uh me here with you today on the cafe do you think you need any introduction father bernie i mean other than that i mean was uh, will that just come out during the show um well i'm the priest of saint timothy's episcopal church and um i think Quite a few of our listeners here on KCIW would know who I am. Okay. And that you weren't born here, but were raised here. Well, I was born in Crescent City, yeah. Close, but well, no cigar. Close enough, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm Robert O'Sullivan. I uh, have had a rather unusual life in that the first kind of half of my adult life, I was largely in uh, media and politics in California. And uh, then in my late 40s, early 50s, I decided to become a high school teacher, uh, which I became both in English and social studies, teaching things like U.S. history and civics, uh, as well as a part-time Lutheran pastor. And I did both of those roles for a good 20-plus years. Uh, And uh, like Father Bernie, I uh, wound up being the pastor of the church I was as a teenager. It's uh, unusual for that to happen, but uh, we share a fair number of things in common that are unusual for men of the alleged cloth. <laughs> so both of these guys have made a career out of talking. Mm-hmm. So uh, I probably won't get a heck of a lot in, so I'll just get some stuff in here quickly when we talk about our um, presidential candidate, uh, I saw, I saw him being interviewed uh, a couple of times this weekend, and one of the interviews somebody asked him about his concern about the environment. And he talked about how oh, when he built buildings, he was so concerned about the environment. And he says, you know, it was, I, I won awards for the way I would mix the sand and the water. I got awards. <laughs> then he pulled a silly stunt of, of working for a, a little while in Mickey D's. I don't, I, I still don't get that. Does that, was he trying to catch up with Kalama or Kamala? I don't know. Might have liked the clown suit possibilities. What? Might have liked the clown suit yeah, possibilities. Yeah, uh, he was trying out for the for for, for Ronald. <laughs> <laughs> Ronald McDonald. That should have been the Hamburglar, though. That's uh, that's another story. Is that Burger King or something else? Okay, let's see. Oh, if he's not elected, Christians will not be safe in this country. I don't know why. Um, FEMA spent more money on the immigrants, so they don't have enough money to help people in the areas that were recently affected by the storms. None of this is true, by the way. These are just things that he has said. Uh, And I'm reminded of, of, uh, he he used to be a regular guest on Howard Stern's radio show. And if if you're familiar with Howard Stern's radio show back in the day, that alone should disqualify you from being president if you uh, will put up with being a guest on that stupid program. But anyway, he used to brag about when he owned the Miss America Teenage something or other, and he could just walk right in the in the guest room and there would be all these wonderful, beautiful women naked, and because he owned it, he could he could he could go in there. This is an adult man saying this, not a kid. Oh, okay, we, I think we've already talked about his discussion about Arnold Palmer. I, I guess he would classify that as locker room talk. I would classify it as, like, uh, middle school locker room talk. I thought. Probably had enough of the lie stuff. Yeah. Um, there are an awful lot of early voters. There's millions and millions of early voters, and I, 
I bet you those people all have all their Christmas shopping done already, too. Mm. Okay, I guess that's it. So we can go on now to the subject at hand. And I have two guys that are staring at me like vultures, like I can't wait to say something. And <laughs> So take it away. Well, you know, um, Pastor Robert and I, we've been working together on various different issues around homelessness, but it's not just uh, homelessness that's our main issue that we're concerned about. It's all the people who are underserved within our community. And there's plenty of people who are housed, but it's precariously housed. They're uh, one paycheck away from losing their housing. There are, uh, there's um, very many uh, people who are having their, um, you know, they're, they're, they're having their uh, homes taken away from them from inability to pay, and they can't have another place to live. They're, it's not like we have a lot of options when it comes to housing in our area. I, I was talking to a guy who's a uh, construction, you know, he's like a contractor, and uh, I'm very glad. We need more contractors. We need more building. We need more homes. The thing that I worry about, though, is that the homes that we're going to build here in this community are going to be uh, three-quarter of a million dollar homes and up instead of the kind of homes that we need in order for the workforce people to be able to live in, the people in the work, you know. One might houses. become vacation homes as well. Yeah. That's a yeah. concern, isn't it? It's contractors are business people, and you go where the money is when you're a business person. Well, we have to figure out how to incentivize low-income housing. And, you know, I, calling it low-income housing makes it sound like, um, you know, it's less than, uh, you know, that sub subpar housing. And what we need is workforce housing. We, originally, when Brookings was came into, uh, became a community. It was a mill town and there were um, homes for the mill workers. And a lot of these homes that are um, down on say, uh, Hemlock Street and uh, Spruce Street and um, up on Pacific Avenue, all the different ones that are kind of in the heart of downtown Brookings. Those homes were made specifically for mill workers to live in. They were small, they were modest, but they were sturdy and are still there now mm -hmm. and, um, and affordable. And we need more of that kind of housing in our community, the kind of, uh, you know, we don't need 2,500 square feet homes, we need 1,200 square foot homes. Yeah. And to incentivize the contractors for, you know, the developers for building those homes, we're gonna have to come up with better strategies. I have some friends that wanna move here and they have a substantial income and their, their budget is half a million dollars and they have not been able to find anything. I've heard similar stories. Yeah. Well, that kind of goes to show, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Half million, and you can't find anything to buy because it's the market starts at six hundred thousand or seven hundred thousand. Mm -hmm. So we got to we 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 have to figure something. Maybe uh, apartment complexes. We have to we have to come up with better alternatives to uh, the housing in our community. So it's kind of my understanding that one of the reasons that we have trouble building, for instance, a subdivision with this kind of housing is that. Everything involved in before you put a shovel in the ground is is full of red tape and is incredibly expensive, getting permits and things of that nature. I've had friends tell me that that they, I I, I know a guy that he owns a piece of land and he would like to put on like a fourplex, mm. and he said that it was going to be cost prohibitive, uh, because of the whatever sewer hookups or whatever. So uh, the most affordable place to live in our area would be the manufactured homes, you know, the parks, the, uh, you know, I call them trailer parks. I don't know if they, maybe there's a better name for them. Manufactured home parks, I think they prefer. Yeah, I suppose, but. Uh, but those are going up as well. Well, unfortunately, um, there is one particular park that I'm aware of where the space rent is $700 a month. And this park is not like the deluxe park. It's, uh, it's it, it has numerous different problems. And uh, it's it's where our working class people are living is in these in, in this particular park, but parks like it. And seven hundred dollars a month space rent. The reason why people originally wanted to live there is because the space rent was like four hundred a month. Mm -hmm. Well, now it's gone from four hundred a month to seven hundred a month. And why is that? Uh, it's because these different out of town investors, um, you know, they bought it, they formed an LLC, and they're extracting money back to Sacramento or wherever it is they live. Maybe it's Portland, wherever it is that they live. And um, now uh, our people can't afford to live there anymore. And when I say our people, I mean the residents of Brookings that are providing the, uh, the, ones, the ones that are stocking the shelves in the grocery stores, the ones who are um, working in the banks, the ones who are uh, uh, making sure that uh, people are having their lawns mowed and uh, you know, taking care of our community on minimum wage type jobs. 
and um, we have to make sure that they can afford to live here too. I, I have a suggestion about where this should go next, and it's giving a little history of St. Tim's as always being involved in, in being sensitive to real live human needs, which a lot of churches don't pay much attention to. Oh, okay. Yeah, I uh, forgot to do this, which I frequently do. We have a way you can cut, get in touch with our guests here by sending us a text. And the phone number is 541-661-4098. It's 541-661-4098. And you can call up and compliment our guests or call them naughty names or do whatever you like. And we have operators standing by, so... Let's not waste our operators standing by money. Give us a, give us a text. Have an opinion. Yep. Our operator's name is Linda. <laughs> so the uh, you know, housing is a big issue f- for uh, for our community at large, but also access to health care is a really big thing. We need to make sure that more we need more primary care providers. Uh, we need more um, we need more dentists that see low income people, as you well know, Ray. Uh, once somebody's on Medicare, that doesn't mean that they're going to have uh, dental coverage. Mm. So um, we need to f- come up with better ways to be able to provide for the care of um, people of all ages when it comes to access to mental health, when it comes to uh, primary care, when it comes to d- access to dental care, when it comes to uh, uh, physical therapy, all the different things that uh, we might be able to find in um, other communities and in fact have to travel to go get those services uh, to other communities. I see a, a um, eye professional twice a year, and I have glaucoma and a few other little things that, that they take care of, but it's uh, it's pretty much my guess that people who don't have coverage or don't have uh, any kind of disposable income see an eye doctor twice a year. Highly unlikely. I, kn- I know I don't. Mm-hmm. So... Uh, when it comes to dental care, there fortunately there's uh, a new dentist um, that's going to see Medicaid patients here in town. He's his practice is um, it's in a soft opening right now. Eventually, it's going to roll out more, um, and it, potentially it will have 2,400 patients uh, because of the lack of people who can get care dental care that are a Medicaid people. That sounds great. You know. It- uh, whenever I go to my doctor for for a checkup, or whenever I have something that I know that can't fix here or deal with here, I have to get in a car and go to Medford. And I loathe going and <laughs> getting in a car and going from going to Medford, other than you know, my trip to Costco. But that's really a problem. If you need any kind of a specialist, pretty much you're going to have to pack up and go. And our working class folks, they're not going to be able to go to no Medford. You know, they're not Costco shoppers, first of all. Right. And so that, that benefit that like you're talking yeah, about, right? yeah, I was going to Costco. I mean, that's fine for news, a lot of us, news, but for the working class people, they, they don't have Costco memberships mm-hmm. and to, to actually go to Medford and come back, they'd have to miss a day of work. They would have the, the cost of the gas, the wear and tear on the car, which may or may not be reliable enough to yes. get there. So uh, to roll out better care here, um, I'll kind of give an example of how desperately this, uh, like dental care is needed here in our community. We, uh, over the last probably 12 years, we've had um, a, a dental van from Medical Teams International has come to the church on different occasions and parked at the church to um, offer uh, free dental care to anyone who meets the income criteria, which is wow. not not that hard for people to do. They're here in town today. Oh, yep. are they? Yep. They just closed up. They just finished um, just a few minutes ago. That's what I was on. When I was coming here, I was getting an update on how many people that we saw. And it was 18. We uh, excuse me, it was 16. We had 16 people that were seen by the dentist on that mobile dental van. So uh, it's a, to have it come on a Sunday isn't you know ideal for us, but we take what it comes our When they say, hey, we got a free day, we can come on that Sunday, I tell them yes, and we'll figure it out. Because How did the community find out about that? that this is the first I've heard of it, but it's oh, yeah, not something okay. I've been paying attention okay. to. Yeah. yeah, so we like I say, we've been having these periodically for the last um, 12 years, maybe, and it might even be more. I, I lose track of the time. It was some. It was probably around 2012, I suppose, when we had our first dental van visit. And sometimes it'll only come twice a year. Sometimes it'll come six times a year. It just depends on the funding because it's all grant funding. Right. And um, so we have to request grant money, and it comes from various different sources. 
and uh, and then they have to have the availability and there's but we knew um, about two weeks ago that it was coming and so it was advertised out on some different Facebook pages mostly oh, okay but there were also uh, other outlets that were I don't even remember. So other, we have a team of people at St. Timothy's that particip- that make sure that our ministries run smoothly. And, um, you know, that's promotion of that was not my uh, We deal. We have a, what we call a soapbox feature here. I think that's what it's called, mm-hmm. where somebody can come in and do a two-minute recording about just about anything. Mm-hmm. And that would be an ideal place to, to advertise that, I think. Yeah, it would. because And what part of what happens is once we get the word out, then word of mouth kind of yes, takes over, yeah. too. But... Uh, we uh, we had, like I say, 16 people, and I got to meet, you know, s- interact with some of them this morning, and it was it was pretty cool because uh, they were doing some other screenings. They had a nurse that came with them, and they were doing some uh, A1C screenings, and they could do it in real time. They had the device set up on the counter that they feed the blood sample through, so that they can while you're there, uh, it, during your dental visit, you can find you can find out what your uh, A1C is, so that your blood sugar level. So they, are they doing fillings and like on the spot? Or? Yeah, and you know, um, extractions is going to be the thing that they can. They're going to get the most value for their time Absolutely, on an extraction yeah. because it's going to take the pain away and it's mm-hmm. going to solve the problem. You know, it's not the, you know, certainly we would wish that people could get root canals and it could be solved mm-hmm. that way. Right. Obviously, I, that's. I happen not to know. Well, I happen to know from firsthand knowledge from last Tuesday that a root canal is two thousand two hundred dollars in grants pass. And yeah. not a lot of fun. Not a lot of fun. And, and I, I have good dental coverage, and I think it would cover half of that. Yeah. But it, it's it's more fun now than it used to be. It used to be hell on earth, but it's, I guess they perfected it now, so it's not as bad. Uh, Which doesn't mean anything as not as bad. But. I I think uh, something that's important to realize historically is what a role St. Tim's has played in this community. Um, I moved here with my wife in 2015, 2016, and it soon became pretty clear that uh, St. Tim's was a place to go for a lot of services. Uh, And as COVID came on and the city just about shut down in many, many ways, St. Tim's was probably the first place around where you could get COVID shots. That's where I got mine. And also, uh, while other people, other social services were were shutting down, the county health department was shut down, St. Tim's was the place to go to get help. And they did a remarkable job. And curiously, what has become another major force in the community, uh, Brookings Corps, uh, basically got its shot at St. Uh, start at St. Tim's. Uh, and uh, it's always been a place, the food bank was started there. Uh, it's always been a place where people know that if they can't get help at other places, St. Tim's was a place to go, which has made it a controversial in its neighborhood. Yeah, absolutely. And, yeah. And, but, but part of its controversy is due to a geographical fact that it's next to a large public park, Azalea Park. And uh, people in the neighborhood who uh, have complaints about somebody going through their trash uh, blame it on somebody going to St. Tim's for lunch or mm-hmm. something like that, while really it might be someone who was camping out in, in Azalea Park the night before and trying to find a few soda bottles to get a little spare change. And, uh, but this congregation has faced extreme discrimination and a lot of uh, just on factual stuff. And it's too bad, but uh, basically the taxpayers have been uh, forced to pay probably over a million dollars if you count all the tax dollars that go into the federal government in the lawsuit uh, where the federal government took the side of St. Tim's. Uh, And when you look at uh, other ways in, in, in which uh, court employees, uh, judges were all involved. Over 625,000 went to lawyers who were involved in the lawsuit. And uh, this could all have been avoided if the city council, who got a complaint from 29 or 30 complaints about vagrants and undesirables hanging out in their neighborhood, 
if the city council at the time tried to work with the church to to try and stop a lot of these alleged complaints from happening. But rather than that, the city council decided to start getting tough on the church. And unfortunately, uh, they apparently didn't even have a high school civics understanding of constitutional law in this country, that uh, there, in many ways, the history of liberty in this country is involving telling governments that they should stay out of certain things. They should stay out of uh, interfering with the freedom of speech, with the freedom of the press, with the freedom of religion and the practice thereof. And they have to treat those things differently. They just can't assume, well, it's in our city and it's a land use uh, issue and we can ignore that, all, all the other stuff, because we live on the banana belt and we're a banana republic all on our, on our own and it doesn't apply to us. And all of that litigation could have not happened if they simply had that understanding that you have to treat churches differently. That understanding is not only in the federal constitution, it's even more clearly stated in the Oregon constitution, which says no law in any form whatever should interfere with people's religious exercise. And for Christians, especially if they take seriously the parable of the last judgment in Matthew, the latter part of the Matthew 25, recognize that to be truly faithful to their Lord, it means being sensitive and responding creatively and lovingly to those who are the least among us, in the words of that. In as much as in the parable, we're, we're reminded that if people are sick or they're naked or they're hungry or they're a stranger, a foreigner, that uh, they should be treated with love and respect. And in the words of a, a famous Roman Catholic theologian who just died, uh, who is the founder of liberation theology, that Christianity should have a peculiar bias on behalf of the poor. And St. Timothy's has shown that with, I, I like to say, in, in spades and in and, uh, and diamonds and clubs and especially in hearts. <laughs> That's good. I, I think like uh, that. the, when you talk about that peculiar bias, I think our city council had just exactly that. They have the bias against the poor. Against, yes. And, 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 that's, and at the, that's at the heart of the issue. And we're glad that St. Tim's was willing to stand up and say, no, you can't do that. And they're part of an, uh, a worldwide communion of churches. And because they're related to churches all over Oregon and all over the United States and all over the world, they could have the resources to fund uh, a, a lawsuit that made it clear that the city should not do what it was trying to do. When I first moved to Brookings, I was going to a, uh, a city council meeting. I happened to mention to a friend, I hadn't been here very long enough. There was something that interested me. And my friend said, well, you're just wasting your time. Don't go to that because they've already made up their mind and whatever you say is not going to change their mind. And I was shocked to find out that that was exactly true. And they've, they've made some decisions, and I won't talk about it because I'm sick of talking about it, that actually endangered the community by uh, removing the possibility of this station being an emergency broadcast uh, network or ne station. So, you know, Ray, I wanted to kind of piggyback on some of the stuff that Pastor Robert was saying, because uh, the, the petition, this whole thing started because of a petition, petition, you know, with the 29 signatures. And specifically, it it wasn't super clear. It said we want to remove, have the vagrants removed from the church or something along those lines. But what they what they were referring to, I have no doubt, was our car camping thing that we had going on Which because is... in the middle of the pandemic, there were, the city council had had a hope that uh, all the 15 churches that are in the city limits, that each one of the churches would have three cars in, the, in their respective parking lots with people in it, and that would take and have, so that um, the unhoused folks would have a place, have places to be so they wouldn't just be roaming around, you know, because at the time we didn't know what to expect out of this pandemic. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, Brookings was a little bit later with the deadly part of it than the rest of the country was because during the Delta wave, August of uh, 2021, we certainly did see 
a large number of people dying from COVID-19. Mm -hmm. But we had already, by then though, we had already like had some fatigue, you know, some COVID fatigue, you know, the, the people who were, people like the social distancing was becoming old by then. And so we let our guard down and then people, and, and then we had that Delta wave was very devastating for us. But what happened though, was that we'd already had at that point, like six or eight months worth of people living in our parking lot. And none of the other churches did have that parking um, the, going on. Yeah. And they, and they had uh, asked us, asked all of the 15 churches to do that. So it wasn't our idea. We didn't ask them if we could have the three cars in our parking lot. They asked us if we would be willing to house the three cars in our parking lot. It made sense to us. We did it. There were requirements that were involved that had to do with sanitation. We met. All, we we made sure that that was all being met, and the people were um, they were kind of doing fine. But after a year, they started to devolve. They started to have some issues that were happening within themselves. Okay. Now, so let me finish this yes. thought just quickly because this is kind of the important part is that when the petition went around, I, I firmly believe it was to end the car camping. And at that point, it made sense that we should end the car camping because the Delta Way was over with. Other churches weren't doing it. Other churches weren't doing it. We needed to move past that. And so we did stop the car camping, which made me think that we had satisfied what the petition was initially requesting. But then the city council decided, no, we need to stop. We need to slow down the um, number of days a week that you feed people. Well, the two things, I didn't see that they were related. Mm -hmm. But yet, that's, this is where we were. Anyway, I'm sorry, Linda. That's okay. We have a text coming Th in. There is our, a text. Our, yes, and I'll read it to you. Yeah. Operator that has been standing by is now has a function. Okay, there we go. Manu it says, the text says, manufactured home parks are having trouble throughout the country with large companies buying out the parks, then forcing out the, oops, forcing out the current residents by raising space rents. Those residents are usually seniors on low fixed incomes or families trying to survive on low wages. Was there any dialogue at all between the city council, the petitioners, and St. Tim's to prevent a lawsuit? Oh, well, those two ideas didn't quite, I, I, it took a change there. But uh, the, I, I fully recognize, you know, that, that thing happening with the manufactured home parks. But then when you switch to the dialogue to try to prevent the lawsuit, absolutely. Because one of the things that we did was we said, okay, we realize there's a problem with the car camping. We will, we will stop it. And we did. And, the, and the, the people and the cars, they went on to wherever else they went on to, but they weren't on the church grounds anymore. And then we set up a rule that said that no one can be on the church grounds after six o'clock at night. It's a it's a uh, agreement that we have with the city police. So the city police, if they're driving by and they see somebody after six o'clock on the church grounds, uh, you know, and I hate to use the word loitering, but, you know, if they see somebody loitering, they can trespass that person and they're no longer they'll no longer be allowed back to the church. And we've had to do that on a few different occasions, but that's because, uh, you know, we want to make sure that we minimize. And, and I know that, you know, there's probably at least one of our neighbors that lives near in close proximity to the church that would laugh at what I have to say. But we really do care about our impact on the community, uh, on the on the homes that surround us. We very much care about that. In fact, this morning when the dental van got there, it was six. Uh, it was like 6.50 or 6.55. It wasn't even seven o'clock yet. It was still dark out. And, you know, it's got a diesel engine and it's kind of loud. And I'm thinking to myself, man, you know what? We need to get this guy plugged in so he can get everything turned off because we don't need, you know, this big Winnebago thing making a bunch of noise in our neighborhood when it's still early and, and it's still dark. And, uh, you know, that we that's a that's a rare occasion. That's not something that happens regularly. But we're very much concerned. And so we did go to the city and we said, what can we do in order to um, in order to uh, make this OK? And they said, um, well, I don't even know what they said. They said, uh, well, we're going to we're going to make this ordinance. Do you want to feed two days a week or three days a week? And I said, well, we currently feed four days a week. So what are you talking about? So their their idea, we wanted to sit down, we wanted to have a conversation, we wanted to get around a table and we wanted to talk about how we can what we can do in order to mitigate the um, you know, the impact of our ministries on the homes that are uh, surrounding us. And instead of having a conversation, what they what the city council told us was we're gonna we're putting in an ordinance and do you do you want two days or do you want three days? And of course the ordinance as the federal judge eventually said was patently un 
uh, unconstitutional because they don't have the right to tell churches how to perform their religious duties in their facility. And what got really worse by the council was they not only decided, tried to limit the time and the number of feedings, they came up with this cockamamie scheme saying that uh, there are too many social services going on in the church and that it was their right to say uh, that they can't be there anymore. They didn't define social services, they didn't pay attention to the constitutional law, and they didn't pay attention to a federal law which was passed in the year 2000 by both houses of Congress unanimously. It's called the a Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act. And it had a remarkable history. It passed Congress unanimously by voice vote. The every No one objected. The sponsors of it, the major sponsors of it in the U.S. Senate was one of, uh, there were two, one of the most conservative members, Orrin Hatch of Utah, and one of the most liberal members, Teddy Kennedy of Massachusetts, and it passed unanimously. And it says that a city or any other government agency has to have a compelling state interest that cannot be resolved by other means. And that means something real serious. It, it's it's not just another land use issue, uh, which the mayor claimed that it was even after the judge ruled and, and, and all that, because the federal legislation says you can't mess with churches unless you have this compelling state interest, and they clearly didn't. Yeah, and, and to piggyback on that, you're saying that they had to come up with the least restrictive means. Yes, the least restrictive and, means of reaching that interest. And we wanted to enter into a dialogue around that. And then they said, no, we're going to do this ordinance. And when they said, we're going to do an ordinance, I said, you, we can't sign up for an ordinance that we will immediately be in violation of. We can't sign up for a permit because that's what the ordinance was, a permit to feed two days a week. I can't get a permit when we're going to be feeding four days a week. I can't yeah. get your permit from you. And then immediately, because I know I'm going to be violating it, so once, so we had to retain um, legal counsel. Once we did that, we couldn't have a conversation anymore. I couldn't, I, we couldn't talk to the city anymore because now we are, um, you know, in, because lawsuits are ab adversarial by nature. And once we've entered into this adversarial relationship, we can't find, how are we going to find a compromise at that point? Doesn't the city council have lawyers? The, the, well, that's this, yeah, this yeah, is yeah, pretty yeah. simple advice for well, well, yeah, well, what are you going to do there? I mean, they, they, I mean, you're saying that this is a given that that the, that 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 the government cannot mess with the church feeding people. That's what the judge that. said. That's what the federal what government said. said as well. Th doesn't the council have an attorney that they say this is what we want to do, and that attorney so, says ah, so. So not not, not only did uh, so you got not only did the judge say that, but before the judge even said that, the United States Department of Justice said that. And they said, no, we don't think so. We, you know, you can't fight City Hall. We're City Hall. You can't fight. We, we do. We, we set the rules here. And I think that I, I don't understand. What, I, I have to believe that their legal team, because there's more than one lawyer involved in all yeah. that, told them this is not going to be, this isn't going to go well for you guys. But by the same token, those lawyers are still collecting a paycheck. Mm -hmm. So what do you do there? Judge so, security. Well, I, I, I don't know what to make of that. I mean, I don't, I don't want to get overly cynical, but somebody- I do. I, I do it all the time. Well, <laughs> somebody, well, I can't, for me to get too cynical is going to it's going to interfere well, with my ability to do my job, but as a it pastor- It makes me a job. <laughs> yeah. The, a, the, the form It's of, job security for me to be cynical. For whatever reason, um, I had a friend many, many years ago. He was a mentor for me, and he said, you don't hire a lawyer and then, and then disregard their advice. <laughs> And um, sadly, I feel like the lawyer, the legal advice that was given to our city council was ignored. So, no, was this the old city council or the so-called? Well, apparently, city apparently, it was every all of the above. <laughs> but you know, those, those that happened in closed sessions. I don't know all the details around it. I don't know what they were told, of course. But what I do know is that we prevailed, and here we are. 
in their argument for uh, what was uh, the 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 escalation they did in this through an abatement procedure, what an abatement procedure is something that city and county governments often use if there's a problem on the property with something like vermin, or too many vehicles, or too many boats, or whatever, and and making the place public an, health an eyesore, and and public health is is the main thing about it. Although sometimes aesthetics plays into it as well. And uh, they tried to fine the church $720 a day until it removed s- certain social services from the property. Does now, it, it, apparently, they never even looked at the big, the first couple of, of items in the, in the Constitution. Uh, uh, and that, and they especially it. did not pay attention to the land, r- religious land use ordinance because that says you can't do it. And their justification for doing it was somebody in the uh, planning department was told to plant or to write a, uh, a summary of why this should be done. And so they apparently Googled the word church uh, and found two definitions saying that the church is a building for Christian worship. Oh. And they found one from a very prestigious dictionary you know, Oxford English Dictionary, and another, the Webster's, uh, Merriam-Webster in, in the U.S. Uh, but the problem is they looked at one definition, and that's all they did. Which and that's, obvious it's not just Christian. Uh, it's not well, just Christian, but, but it's, it's also— more than just worship. It's communities of people. It's yeah. uh, communities of people yeah. committed to good deeds. Yeah. And uh, anyway, they're, they're saying, based on— a totally illogical and slightly bizarre uh, idea that churches could not be helping people to get health care. They could not be feeding people. That all of the, That's not worship. And if it's not worship, it doesn't belong in a building built for worship. That made I, no sense. I'm not, I'm not a particularly religious person, to say the least, but isn't that a lot of the stuff that Jesus did? <laughs> you bet him, Red Rider. <laughs> yeah, it seems that way. <laughs> let, me, let me get this phone number in again in case you want to uh, uh, jump in. You can text us at 541-661-4098. 541-661-4098. Operators are standing by. So one of the things that I wanted to comment, Ray, is that, um, you know, so that the lawsuit's over, the money's been settled out, you know, they paid their attorneys all the way through, uh, you know, that amounted to $225,000. Then they were responsible for a portion of how much our law, our, our legal fees were that we didn't get compensated fully, but our law firm agreed to an amount that was $400,000 law firms. It's plural. I get there's more than one law firm. And so the whole cost to the taxpayer of the city of Brickings is 625000 That's how that m- amount got around. And that didn't go to us. I mean, the church didn't see any of that money. That went to our to our legal uh, our, our, our legal um, team. But what the thing is, is what we want to do now is focus on moving forward. And when I talk about this housing problem that we have, what we want to do, what we what we want to strive toward is um, like a like a tiny village, like what's going on in Medford and there's, there's a, they have it go, um, in uh, Eugene, certainly. To a certain extent, they have it in Eureka. And w- what's going on in Grants Pass? Mm-hmm. You know, they have kind of a tent city thing going on that isn't what I, I want. What I would like to see are little structures and people, a piece of land with a fence around it where they have a restroom and hygiene and all the different things that they need, uh, you know, in order to um, survive and be, uh, and be, um, to, to, to get their basic needs met. Isn't there something like that in Medford? Yeah, it, it's called, uh, oppor- well, I forget what they're all called, Hope Village, Opportunity Village. Yeah. There's different ones throughout the state and throughout the region. And so there would be tiny structures of com- some kind mm-hmm. you know, that might be pallet, um, what do they call them, pallet homes or pallet, pallet shelters. There's the Conestoga types. There's things that look like storage sheds, the, uh, the Medford one with uh, Rogue Retreat. They're like little duplexes where the the structures have, uh, you know, there's a common wall and there one. But regardless of what that looks like, a piece of land to be able to place this, that is the sticking point. We can build the structures. That's not the problem. We can always get, we can always figure out the structures. What we can't figure out is the land that we need in order to put this uh, tiny home uh, village. 
And, um, you know, we, we might only get 30 people in there, but out of, cause there's probably 200 people that are unhoused at any given time in the city, you know, in our area. And so say we only get 30 in there, but then there's also, uh, you know, an, a, a newly opened, um, shelter. Uh, there's a home where there's already 10 people. There's going to be a, a winter shelter program, you know, that we've had in the past. And that'll get another twenty people off the uh, off the ground um, into. Uh, is this what core is doing? Yeah. Could, so could you briefly explain exactly what core is? Well, well, Brookings Core Response is very much involved in making sure that people stay housed and get housed, and that's uh, and they're also very much concerned, like we are, with people's uh, health, uh, you know, access to primary care uh, providers, and um, and making sure that people are able to pay their bills so they don't lose their housing. So. Uh, we share that common mission. Um, you know, they, they're a secular organization. We're a church, but we still have the same set of values, and uh, we want to we want to actually be able to work with them uh, so that we can get this tiny home village thing set up. But the sticking point is: is where do you put it? You got to have the land. You got to have a place to put these structures. And within city limits would be far would preferable. be would be preferable. So we want we absolutely want to be able to work with the city moving forward to be able to provide a viable place for people to stay while they transition into a better life. We okay, our operator work. is earning her living right now. She has another text for us. We do have another text. Here it is. Do Father Bernie and Pastor Robert feel the outcome of the 2024 election will have a big impact on how organizations like St. Tim's will be able to continue helping homeless and underserved people? So you know, one thing about that, Linda, is that uh, I, I, I'm not I'm not a political animal. I I don't have a political party that I belong to. I, I've been unaffiliated from a political party. I'm not even independent. I'm unaffiliated. I don't vote in primaries. You know, I, I certainly vote, but I don't vote in primaries because you know I'm don't belong to a, to a uh, to a political party. But uh, you know, we want to maintain the separation between church and state. As a congregation, we, do, we, we don't comment on political candidates. Uh, what we do comment on are legislation that affects the people that we serve. So if there's legislation that has to do with rolling out and expanding food stamps, we're going to be in favor of that. If there's uh, a political candidate that you know may or may not fit what we think is appropriate or, well, not we, I, we don't, we don't have I mean, that, none of that. I don't have an opinion on any of that. So... The fact of the matter is, is regardless of who becomes president, we're going to continue to serve people who are underserved. Okay. A, a lot of people drive down the street and they see these homeless encampments or maybe one or two tents or, and they all, all not all, a lot of them just seem to have an, a horrible mess, like 10, these huge garbage bags and, uh, uh, and, they, and they wonder, you know, what is this all about? What are these people doing here? Why, uh, I just do not understand the homeless situation at all. And I going back to what you said earlier, that just because you have a job doesn't mean you have a place to live because mm. if you're pumping gas or something, I would imagine you can't find a place. Well, many of our people who are unhoused have jobs, and they've had jobs for years, in fact. The bet, where are they going to live? Yeah. And so that kind of comes brings us back full circle, too, that we don't have a house. There's no place for the, the, the rungs on the ladder to climb out of unhoused status into house status those rungs are too far apart we need to put some smaller rungs in between so that people can make their way from living on the ground to living in an apartment or whatever and i i don't want to be a drive-by psychologist or something but it looks like a lot of these people uh, have some mental problems well there's no doubt that they do yeah. and uh you know we need we need better services for them in that regard and adapt is doing and they're doing a good job but they need to bring in more people more professionals so that they can care for the people. But when they want to bring someone in, where where's that person going to live? So this housing thing, it 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 it, it, it takes in all of our problems. My, my favorite is where their wives going to shop. Well, the thing the thing you hear all the it. time why there's no doctors here because their wives have no place to shop. <laughs> well, I, I there's there's all kinds of reasons why people, you know, retirees like to live here because, mm -hmm. you know, it's beautiful and and, uh, you know, they sold a house down in San Jose for a million and a half. Right. And they got a pocket full of money. They can afford to live here. Mm -hmm. But uh, when it comes to the people who are uh, working in the stores and, you know, we used to talk about people pumping gas, which is, you know, now that we have the self-serve thing. But uh, 
we we need to be able to uh, get them to a point where they can save up their money, where they're not just living to survive, but living to be able to move towards stability in their lives. That That is so paramount in importance to us as a congregation. Yeah, I think a lot of people just don't understand. They say, well, I made it. Why Why haven't they made it? You well, know, right? You know, I was why? a teenager. I got a job and I did. But I had the, and I was talking to a friend of mine the other day that we both had the, the, the advantage of, first of all, being born with uh, at least enough intelligence to get by in the world, which a lot of people aren't. That we were also raised in, or in some way influenced by somebody who uh, uh, taught us uh, a work ethic and things like that. Uh, and a lot of these people just were not. Well, so that has, there's many different levels to that. People experience different levels of trauma. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, like and say stability and family life when they're young. Right. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's pretty much what I was saying. Yeah. So we, we were brought up in, in normal house homes, or at least pretty close to normal, or enough that we were able to survive and go out and get a job and do what you're supposed to do. The number of people that have, that, uh, have grown up um, in, this, in this area, but, you know, maybe they grew up somewhere else and they ended up here. That are, the number of people that experienced adverse childhood experiences is tremendous, mm. and so maybe they're, uh, you know, we're talking about um, children that that are being uh, molested, raped by a family member or a trusted friend, um, and that person is uh, has all kinds of emotional and uh, mental issues, PTSD. A full gambit of things in their we're lives. Going to be looking into that in next week's program, by the way. Well, it's a good topic. That's our insanity. That's a good. That's a really good topic, Ray. I'll be listening in because what what happens when those people aren't given the? I mean, first of all, we society has allowed them to be completely broken by not intervening, and then not only that, they never got justice. Whoever it is that perpetrated that violence against that person was never brought to justice. I used to be a sexual abuse investigator. That's what I did with the Alaska State Troopers, and uh, before. Before I became an investigator, I was on patrol, and it was just amazing the things you'd see going into houses. And there was one small community I, I would uh, I was would go to, and I got a call about a domestic incident at a certain house. And I knocked on the door, and there were like three kids in there, and a small community. They all knew me, and they said, "Oh, hi, Ray," and sat down, and continued to watch television. Mom's in the bedroom. You know, it was so. The house was so hectic that the idea of the cops coming to the door d d didn't mean anything to them because they had that television show to watch and mom was in the bedroom. I'd like to mention a whole other element uh, relating to St. Tim's is when the onslaught by the city against the church was getting real serious, uh, it also became clear that there was little in the way of local uh, media and journalism to let the local people know exactly what this We're was all, working on that. Uh, all about. The, the local uh, pilot lists uh, didn't cover it very well. Uh, this radio station did, but it's limited in its resources. And the only other uh, nearby uh, media outlet, the Lost Coast, uh, whatever, Coast Outpost, yeah. Outpost, did a, a good job. But... Uh, uh, so I personally kind of made it my um, job, as it were, to try to find ways of publicizing it worldwide through YouTube and a website called progressivechristianity.org so that people who anywhere from now on want to find out what happened, we have a whole playlist on, on YouTube of maybe 13 items of, about St. Tim's. Uh, I... The, the Progressive Christianity website has had four major articles, and I've been getting uh, communications from South Africa, from Australia, uh, and uh, a whole number of places within the U.S., uh, either sympathizing with the church or saying, hey, the same thing is going on here in Minnesota. Our church is right near a big park, and we're, si we're serious in our efforts to, to feed the, the poor. And some churches uh, do uh, feedings that are related to their missionary or proselytizing efforts. And St. Tim's and Episcopal Church generally uh, and a lot of other churches don't do that. They, they, they're offering a meal and the fellowship and human interaction that takes place during that meal. And uh, 
they're they're not trying to convert anyone. They're just showing respect and love, which they understand by their faith is what they're supposed to do. But uh, imagine if it, if a uh, uh, a church didn't have the connections that an Episcopal church has. If they got serious about feeding the poor in the same way that St. Tim said, and and the city started prosecuting them, they wouldn't stand a chance because they they didn't have. Uh, the type of a support of the Episcopal Church and a law firm that is noted for its uh, willingness to do pro bono publico work. That means legal work on behalf of the public. And if they do that, and if they lose the suit, they're, they're willing to swallow the expenses. But if they win the suit, they get their resources. And uh, uh, I, I don't quite know the negotiation after uh, the, the the federal judge's decision, but it seems to me they cut their own fee in order to stop the really absurd abatement procedure, which was still alive and could go, could have gone on and created another lawsuit, which would be far more damaging. So. Well, absolutely, they did pester over. Absolutely, they they cut their fee and uh, took a, a, a probably two thirds of what they would have actually been. Mm-hmm. You know what their billable hours were. Because uh, because they, they they wanted to move things forward, and I'm glad they did. Oh yeah. Because uh, it was already it had already taken up far too much of our you know emotional and spiritual energy as it was. But I'll tell you the 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 one thing that really uh, you, you know Ray was talking about well the garbage you know when we see the people and they're unhoused in the garbage. Um, when I see that, my thought is is what can I do to make that situation better. Instead of demonizing the person, right. my thought is, is how do I organize to be able to figure out how to collect their garbage? Yeah. How do I help clean up the mess? How do I help empower them to clean up their own mess? These are the thoughts that I have. My thought isn't they must be scumbag individuals, you know, that are subhuman. My thought is, is that if they're living like that, it's my, it's my responsibility to give them the hand up so that they don't have to live like that anymore. I would guess, I don't, again, don't want to play psychiatrist, but the people who are living in this five huge bags of garbage next to their tent are probably some of the mentally ill people or people with mental problems. Well, one of the things about the bags of garbage is if you're on Highway 101, the um, Oregon Department of Transportation will pick up those bags. Oh, did you? Yeah, there's, I, I don't know what the schedule is or how that all works, but they have asked them to keep their garbage alongside the road. Oh, Like good. once a week, they'll come by and get it. So it's not what it looked like to me going by. So, when, so it's been put there, and if it's been put out toward the road, it's deliberately set there for them to pick it up. But the scheduling, you know, it's not, they don't go mm-hmm. by daily and whether they go by weekly or however that works. But that's only on the, oh, that's only on state roads. So if it's a county road, it's not going to work like that. I've, I've lived here for about six or seven years now. And in that time, I have never once been uh, bothered by a, a homeless person. I think I had one ask me for a match one time, and he legitimately wanted a match. It wasn't the, it wasn't the opening line. And then one day, I was I was coming out of the studio here and, and uh, getting in my truck, and there was a, a, a homeless person there with a dog. Well, my dog had just died, and I had a bunch of biscuits in the, in, in the glove compartment that so I asked this guy if he wanted the biscuits, and he was actually a little reluctant, and then he, he took them. And I uh, said, so, well, okay. The next day on Facebook, which I was on for a very short period of time, this is one of the reasons I left, there was criticism of me interacting with a homeless person and giving them something out of my truck. For their so dog. I, huh? For their dog. Well, or, th- you couldn't tell if you were across the street or something. Oh, I was just handing him something, and it was yeah. one of these dog biscuits. But I'm thinking, is there, is there the homeless police that are, well, that are checking on these I people? Think, <laughs> well, you hit on something. And, and not only at 441 or something like that, <laughs> he was saying. But what you're hitting on is somebody's driving by, mm-hmm. and they're looking out their windshield, and they've decided that they know what all those interactions were. They've decided they know all the things that need to – they fill in the gaps on the story. They, they see the person, they make the decision about, you know, why doesn't that person have a job? Right. That they look capable of working to me. They have no idea who that person is. They have no idea what the challenges they now, face. Where does he get the nerve to give them something? But that, they, and they have no idea that what you're doing is giving dog treats to the dog. Uh, they have no idea. It could have been a hand sandwich or, or uh, uh, 
it's something really good. It's none of their business. So what I would say is that what we need to do as a population, as a community, is not have contempt prior to investigation. We need to we need to recognize within ourselves our prejudices when we have come to conclusions based on no information. All right. We need we we all need to take because we're all guilty of it. I do it too. I have plenty plenty of people that I you know make thoughts or you know fill mm-hmm. in gaps. I have no idea what I'm talking about. But I try to recognize that and keep my mouth shut if I can. At the at the t- at the time that this incident happened, because uh, I was on Facebook about two weeks, and I re- started to realize I'm starting to dislike people I otherwise like because of some of their comments. And I don't know if that was just a a short period of time where there was a lot of Facebook stuff about the homeless. And one friend of mine was talking about, well, you have to carry a baseball bat in in your car. And, and uh, talking about how much trouble it was to get into Fred Meyer, and that would be a good use for the bit. They actually talked about giving poison food to the homeless camps and things like that. Yeah, that stuff drives me crazy. Is that so was, so was I looking at a short period of time in Facebook, or is that oh, always it, like that? It depends. I you know, avoided it, it. It goes in spurts. I, I try to kind of pay attention to what's going on, and it goes in spurts. Yeah. But the fact is is that unhoused people are far more likely to be the victims of crime oh, than yeah. to be the perpetrators of yeah. crime. And, and, you know, sometimes they, they get into, you know, they're hanging out, they're spending a lot of time with each other, and they might have altercations amongst each other. A lot of that has to do with the, a lot of that has to do with the mental health stuff, though. We're, we're running out of time, but very quickly, there was, uh, there was one vocal person who used to go to council meetings a lot, who was very vocal about, about homeless. And one of the things he said is, we have to clean up the drugs, and when we clean up the drugs, the homeless will leave. Yeah, that's I w- it, it's not that simple even even at all. And they're not going to leave. They were they're from here in the first place. Right. These are people that went to Brigham's Over High School, like myself. These aren't people who uh, showed up here because somehow or another they they they're looking for the easier, softer ride. You know. Yeah. These are people that are that they're our own people. Sit Sister, down to three minutes. Sister Cora Linda or Cora Rose. Or Cora Rose, uh, uh, when she testified before the council. Uh, said the first day she went to work, and then she's a lawyer as well as a Lutheran deacon, and the first day she went to work at St. Tim's, she was shocked that five of the people that were needing help in one form or another were classmates of hers when oh, she went to high. Brookings yeah. Harbor High. And yep. uh, uh, there, there are transient homeless all over this country, and there are people f- trying to find a good place to somehow survive and perhaps maybe maybe thrive we used to have a guy here who did uh, uh he was he had this unbelievable alabama accent which is the reason i grabbed him to, to, to do a show and he would tell these little stories about when he was homeless and things like that and he said that he was he was on the road once and he had this camera and he's in line for for some kind of a food thing and people are, are not not wanting him to take their pictures because they just didn't want to be seen like that. And, and he said, and he couldn't understand it. He said, you know, a lot of people don't realize that you may just be a few minutes away from being homeless yourself. It wouldn't take too many turns of fate. Okay, now we're down to two minutes. <laughs> Wrap up. Well, the, so one of the things that I want to, you know, I guess to summarize uh, our position as a church, we very much care, we care deeply about um creating stability in the lives of people. And you can't have stability in your life if you don't have a place where you can be. So housing is extremely important to us. And uh, we, wanna, we wanna see uh, better more op- better options and more options for people who are- You've got one minute. Well, tell, us how, tell us how we give St. Timothy's money. Oh, well, you just write a check, send it to the church. That's the simplest way. Okay, yeah. can you do it online? Do you have- Yeah, one? our website, stintimothyepiscopal.org. Okay. I, I want to say in the 50 seconds we have left how proud Brookings, I think, should be of St. Tim's, uh, especially of Sister Coral Rose and, and Pastor Bernie, but a, a whole group of volunteers who are seriously involved in, in, in getting help to people who really need it. And they see this as part of their own faith and their own commitment. And Brookings should be very proud. Okay, you've been listening to a Curry Cafe, where we have informal discussions like the one you just heard. If you want to be a part, go to kciw.org and send us an email. We can have you on if you want to be. Mm-hmm.